one of the greatest gifts God can give to any person is the ability to see the truth. We're so deluded in our lives and so controlled by our, by our addictions that um, when the Spirit of God moves into your life, you, you and I see um, the wrong thinking we've had. And something takes place called repentance. It's the gift of repentance, the Bible calls it. And what it means is to turn around in your mind. I mean, to change your mind about the way you thought about um, those things, those activities, that, that, that way of life. And so this song is about that. No stone at my head, no flowers on my tomb, no gold-plated sign. In some marble pillared room The one thing I ask When they put me in the ground When I die Tear my still house down When I was a boy Way back in the hills I laughed at the men who tended those stills but that old mountain shine well it caught me somehow when I die tear my still house down tear my still house down let it go to rust don't leave no trace to the hiding place where I made that evil stuff for all my time and money no prophet did I see that old copper kettle was the death of me. Tell all your children that hell ain't no dream. Satan lives in my whiskey machine. And when I'm dead and gone, well, I know where I'm bound. When I die, tear my steel house down. Oh, dear Lord, I tremble and I quake. Thinking about all that corn mash I made. But I heard that there is mercy with you is where it's found so when I die tear my still house down tear my still house down let it go to rust don't leave no trace to the hiding place where I made that evil stuff for all my time and money no profit did I see that old copper kettle was the death of me. Yeah, that old copper kettle was the death of me. You know, I'm looking to, uh, forward to heaven for a lot of different reasons. Of course, to see the Lord, you know, to see my loved ones and friends that have gone on ahead of me, that's going to be incredible. But one of the really cool things that's going to happen for us in heaven is that we are going to see him as he is and we will be like him. That means finally I'm going to change and become the person that I wish I could be. I've been doing this for a long time, and uh, I entrusted Christ in 1971. And the Lord has done some great stuff in my life, and, uh, you know, some wonderful changes. And, but I still have so far to go. You know, I, I look at myself sometimes in the mirror, and I say, you know, Tommy boy, are you ever going to get it? You know? <laughs> um, I just struggle with me. I'm sure you struggle with you. Where do we go for change? How does change actually happen in our lives? You know, I think of my dad. Uh, he, was a, he was a great man. He had a drinking problem, though, for many, many, many years. 
Um, he quit drinking about 40, 42 years before he died. But uh, he had a terrible drinking problem, and it was tied to a tragedy that happened to him when he was 13 years old. It was Christmas Eve, and uh, his mother was uh, baking Christmas cookies. And she said, boys, um, I, need some, I need some confectioner sugar, so she gave my dad a nickel. This is way back, 1930s. Uh, I take it back, 19, 1940, probably, 1940, 1941, something like that. Anyhow, you boys go to the store and, uh, and get some confectioner sugar. And, they, and Christmas Eve, they go to the store, and the grocer uh, said, boys, you, you take that. That's, that's for you for Christmas. You know, Merry Christmas, and you keep your money. So my dad said to his little brother, hey, we can buy pop. And he said to his little brother, you wait here, and I'll run across the street to the gas station. And dad ran across the street. And his little brother stepped out into the street and was hit and killed. And uh, my poor grandmother lost her mind, you know. She spent a year in bed. It was just an awful time in the family's life. And my dad was blamed for the death of his brother. And I think that's one of the things that drove my dad to like the buzz you get from booze, you know. So we drank. Hard and heavy for a long, long time. And um, some events happened in his life, and he eventually let that go. But the reason my dad drank, I think, was to forget. It kind of took the, the, uh, the, your, your, your spinning mind of the guilt away, even though it wasn't real guilt. I think it ran his life. How do we get beyond that? I mean, the world says drink and forget, right? But Jesus tells us to do something different. When he instituted what we celebrate as communion as Christians, he told us to drink and remember. We've got to keep going back to a time, a moment in time, when Jesus was here on earth and he did something for us. He died spread eagle on cross beams over a town garbage heap for you and me. And he took the curse that we're all under and all of our individual sin, and he died for us there, nailed to that cross. After he was taken down from the cross and placed in the grave, he did what he promised he would do. Three days later, he walked out of the grave alive uh, to prove that everything he said was true, and also to prove that his payment for our sin was complete. He said on the cross, it is finished. Remember those words? That's a, that is actually a financial term. It means literally paid in full. I mean, that, that, we've got to keep going back to that because there's stuff that drives our life, guilt and shame and you know, that, that fuels our addictions. And we have to keep going back to Jesus and back to that cross. And that, going back to him, is what, what really helps us with changing. I want to read you a section from the book of Ephesians, a letter that Paul wrote to these dear folks. And he says to them, this is chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints. Uh, those aren't special people. Those are just God's people, okay, when the Bible talks about saints. It's not it's talking about people who they made statues of and put, put in some church building. It's talking about you and me. Together with all the, st the saints to grasp how wide, how long, and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. This might sound strange to you. Um, and of course, uh, this is a, a more literal translation, so it's a little awkward um, when it comes to English. But it says so much there's this tendency, especially if you've been a Christian for a long time, is that, you know, you're not changing fast enough. You still struggle too much. And so we start listening to other people saying how they, how they found, the, you know, the answer, how they found the key to 
you know, to biblical living. And, um, you know, they, they have all these PowerPoint presentations to show us, you know, that we're real big losers and you don't have to be a loser. You, you know, you can, you know, find victory, um, you know, beyond where you are now. And we can kind of get duped into that. I got to tell you, my buddy Rick said he went to a pastor's conference and they had a guy from South America that was preaching in English, but he had a heavy accent. And he was talking about everybody being a winner, okay? But the way he said it, it came out different. He said, you are wiener. I am wiener. We are all wieners. Rick said he was on the floor just dying laughing, you know? <laughs> but we all want to be a wiener, right? not a loser, right? But, um, you know, it's, our tendency then is to think there's some super Christian somewhere that's going to tell us, you know, how, you know, how we can... Uh, how we can find the victorious life. I want you to know the victorious life is found one place and one place alone. At the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ. Nowhere else. Jesus is the one who said, come to me and I will give you rest, right? He's the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I am um, the water of life. He said, I am... Uh, I am the bread of life. You know, the whole idea of being satisfied and, and having a fulfilled life. You find it all with Jesus. You know, and people try to stick a bunch of religious rules with it. Uh, and they did that. Um, Paul wrote a book to the Galatians about how messed up they were. They thought that if they became uh, Jewish, then if they, they practiced Judaism, somehow they would be a complete Christian. And Paul had to blow them away. Um, you should read in Galatians chapter 3. is pretty... He's pretty livid, and he kind of lays it out to him as Jesus or nothing, and uh, it's pretty beautiful. But you can't add anything to it. Debbie's a terrific cook. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry for you that you don't live in this house, because uh, that girl gets going in the kitchen, and it's the best stuff you ever put in your mouth. Uh, not only is it like living with a movie star, but it's also like living with Julia Child. It's just, what a great mix, huh? Um... She has these recipes that she's developed over the years that are fantastic. Her signature recipes, a lot of baking stuff. Her oatmeal cookies, you know, forget Mrs. Fields. Mrs. Hampton is way better than Mrs. Fields. They're just unbelievable. Several times people say, hey, can I have the recipe for that? So this long years of working on a recipe, she'll give it to them. And then we'll go to their house and they say, oh, honey, I made your chocolate cake. And you take a piece of that cake and you take, put it, I put it in my mouth, and I'll say to her privately, this isn't the same recipe. She goes, oh, no. She, she added a bunch of stuff. Or they took something out, you know, like I don't like salt in that or, you know, or what, whatever. I don't like nuts in that or I don't like this. And they alter the recipe, and it ruins it. Whenever you alter the recipe of, you know, something that's done by a master, it just messes it all up. Well, Jesus, our Lord and Master, purchased everything for us on the cross. Everything you need was given to you when you believed in Jesus. Everything. Watch out for those people that try to, here's the word, I know it's a good word, I wish there was a different word for this, but people will come to you and say, listen, you know, I'd really like to disciple you. I'd really like to, uh, you know, we should get together once a week, have coffee, and and, you know, I can help you in your spiritual progress. Usually, I mean, there's some people, everybody needs friends. We all need friends that we can be honest with and, you know, laugh and cry with and tell the truth about our own struggles. Yeah, that's true. But when someone comes to you and says they want to meet with you and they want to help you along in your journey, usually they have a tremendous need to manipulate and control. And they're just going to try to make you into a version of themselves, you know. Um, and I just say, run like heck. If someone's looking to alter you, don't, don't mess with it. Let Jesus do the altering in you. And when you came to Jesus, you got everything you need. My second point is this. When you came to Jesus, you got everything you need to change. Everything you needed. In this uh, the section I, I read to you in uh, Ephesians, it talks uh, about how change happens for us. And it's really simple. Just look at this. He says... Uh, in the, the middle of verse 16, well, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. You know where you get the ability to do the right thing? You get it from him. 
If you've trusted Christ, he lives in you. That's the power that you need to change. The Holy Spirit himself has moved in. And, um, and if you, the Bible says if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Christ. The, the, so anybody who believes in Jesus, automatically the Spirit of God moves into your life. And I know there are people that teach that you have to have something else happen to you after you believe in Jesus to receive the Holy Spirit. That's a little bit misguided because when you trust in Jesus, the Spirit of God moves into you. It's not us getting more of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of us kind of giving the Holy Spirit more of ourselves. Um, there's that power. The power to change is, is there. So, um, and so not, not only have you received the Holy Spirit, but you have been loved. And you have been loved completely by the real God who sent his son to die for you. And it's the growing in the understanding of that love that changes everything. Because we have the Spirit of God living inside to give us power. But the motivation is going to be the fact that, that he loves me. Let me, let me give you a, um, a quote from my friend Steve Brown. This is profound if you think about it. He said, The only people who change are those who realize that if they never change, they will still be loved. I'm going to read that again. The only people who change are those who realize that if they never change, they are still loved. The Lord will never throw you away. You, you have to realize that this, this change, our lives changing doesn't happen by us trying harder. You know, the, the, the Bible is just, it seems backward to us, you know. In order to win, you have to surrender. You know, that's just, that's just weird, right? That just goes against the grain for us, but it's true. We have to um, submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit that lives within us. And we have to focus on one simple truth. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In fact, I'm almost done. But I just want to say this, this simple focus of life is what changes us. Listen to this. The, the quest of our life is to know him better and to understand his love. Paul says to these guys, I pray that you being rooted and established in love, not in shame, not in guilt, not in trying harder. Do you hear that? I want you to be rooted and established in love. And those are two terms. Um, rooted is a, an agricultural word, right? which means that the only earth, the only um, soil that you can actually grow in is the soil of God's love. And we're rooted and established, that's an architectural term. Um, the only real foundation for your life can only be the love of God, that he loves you and he'll never let you go. Rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of God, and get this, and to know this love that surpasses all knowledge. He said here that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. This, not the idea of Jesus being in your life, but Jesus dwelling um, is the idea of well, um, bringing Jesus in off the front porch. Okay, I guess the way to put it, um, I was at my buddy's house, doorbell rings, it's his neighbor. And my buddy, when he answers the door, he goes, hey, 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 hi, he calls the guy by name and goes outside and closes the door and stays on the porch with the guy, talks for a few minutes and then comes in. I say, why didn't you invite him in? He said, oh man, if I invite him in, he'll never leave, okay? Sometimes we treat Jesus like that. Instead of keeping Jesus on the front porch of your life, why don't you open up all the doors and windows and closets to Jesus? The good, the bad, the ugly. Open it all up. Dwell. Debbie and I were driving back from the south once and through uh, Williamsburg. We drove up there and um, spent the day at, uh, uh, in the historical district there. Uh, the, the museum part of Williamsburg is great. I love those guys at the Anthony Hay shop that 
create all that incredible 18th century furniture with no electricity. I love those guys. Great craftsmen. Mid Mac Headley and those guys that used to be there. Anyhow, we went up, had a big day. And then, uh, I, you know, being the planner that I'm not, I didn't get us a room. I, I figured, oh, there'd be plenty of rooms. Well, there wasn't. And we ended up staying in this dive, you know, um, just a ter terrible, worst hotel I have ever been in. This place was probably great, like 1948, okay? But this was 1990-something, 90 98, 99, something like that. And it was a dive. It was awful. I looked under the bed. Debbie said, check under the bed to make sure there's no bugs, okay? So I looked under the bed. I couldn't see any bugs because of all the old clothing and junk, you know, like, you know, like potato chip bags and stuff. I didn't tell her. I said, yep, no bugs. Got back in bed. That place was terrible. We laid there awake till about two in the morning. Debbie looked at me and said, you sleep? I said, no. She said, let's get out of here. Okay. You know, that we, we weren't going to move in that place, right? And dwell there. We, that, you know, we got out of there as fast as we could. When it comes to Jesus, we want to welcome him to dwell, you know, in every area of our life. And then, and then the, the focus is this, that we would, uh, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. The word know is very interesting. It, it means something beyond um, book learning, um, learning a concept. Uh, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. That means you can't learn it. You can't read something and know it. You can't, you're not studying for a test here. This is something that can only be experienced. Down south, Debbie and I have a lawyer. It's, um, and I, I just giggle whenever I'm around him because his name is Dickie Lester. Hi, this here is Dickie Lester. You know, and his friends call him Little Dickie Lester. You know, it just cracks me up. Um, he's handled some stuff for us through the years. And um, one of his associates, Karen, um, we've dealt with it a couple of times. And, and she told us that she lives on a high rise, in a high rise on the beach. She's lived there 20 years. And you know what she told us? She told us that after living on the beach for 20 years, she's never been to the beach. Now you get in a high rise, you don't experience the beach because you're just way up. The view's incredible, but you haven't experienced the beach. You haven't gotten your toes in the sand and in the water. You haven't heard the cry of the birds. You haven't watched the tides rise and fall. You haven't felt the breeze. You haven't got the taste of salt on your fingers from being out there. You know what I mean? Just the experience of spending days on the ocean. And I mean, not in a high rise. I mean, at the ocean. So she was on the ocean, just not at the ocean. Jesus doesn't want you to just know about him. It's not, it is, of course, about knowing him as our Savior, but he wants you to experience this love that he has for you. He wants you to um, know it. I mean, by experiencing it. And as you fail from time to time, and you go back to him and you find open arms. When you look at the life of Peter after you deny Jesus, Jesus goes looking for him to restore him. Jesus told the story of a, a young man who, who took his inheritance, left his father when his duty was to stay home and take care of his dad, um, and ran off with you know prostitutes and crazy living and spent all of his money and ended up feeding pigs, and uh, he finally came to himself, it says, and he said, what am I doing? My, my father's servants live so much better than this. I'll go back to my father. And he was going to tell him, I don't deserve to be your son. Just let me work on your farm. And the Bible says why he was still a long way off, his father saw him and ran to him. Listen, you're still a sinner. Let him love you. It'll be absolutely life-changing when you realize that he's not mad at you anymore because you know Jesus. If you trust Christ as your Savior, you're forgiven past, 
present, and future. And, you know, please don't say to me, hey, Tom, you know, you're, um, you, you're saying it's okay to just do crazy, sinful things. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that's not how you change. I mean, sin hurts us, hurts others, hurts God, um, uh, you know, causes all kinds of heartache. So the only thing that changes us and turns us from those wrong and crazy things in our life is the fact that he loves us. I did a lot of stupid, crazy things when I was a kid. You want to know what kept me from doing a bunch more crazy, stupid things? I didn't want to embarrass my mother. She loved me, man. What a great lady. And one of the greatest things in my life was that she was proud of me. And just her love for me is what motivated me to want to please her and love her. It's the same way with the Lord. The only thing that changes us is his love. Hey, you think about that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this incredible love that is beyond our understanding, but not beyond our experiencing. Would you help my friends? Thank you for loving us and never letting us go. I ask for my friends who have uh, failed and have trouble looking up to heaven when they pray today. I ask that you'd lift them up and may they realize your complete devotion and love to them. Lord, change us. Make us more like you. Draw us near your heart. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for listening. If you would like to support Community Bible Church, we would appreciate your prayers and gifts. We can be reached at Community Bible Church, 1888 Crescent Lake Road, Waterford, Michigan, 48327, or at our website, www.cbcmi.com. We'd appreciate your gifts. We know that many can't give right now. So if you would, you'd be a great blessing to your brothers and sisters. God bless you. Have a great day.